Chapter 2 Music in the Night I feel at this time there are a few things you should know about the Chester. He is not your ordinary cat, but then I'm not your ordinary dog, since an ordinary dog wouldn't be writing this book, would he? Chester came into the house several years ago as a birthday gift for Mr. Munro, along with the two volumes of G.K. Chesterton, hence the name Chester, and a first edition of Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. As a result of this introduction to literature, and given the fact that Mr. Munro is an English professor, Chester developed a taste of reading early in life. I, on the other hand, have developed a taste for books. I found Jonathan Livingston Seagull particularly delicious. From Chester's ki kittenhood on, Mr. Munro has used him as a sounding board for all his students' lectures. If Chester doesn't fall asleep when Mr. Munro is talking, the lecture can be co counted a success. Every night, when the family is sleeping, Chester goes to the bookshelf, selects his midnight reading, and curls up on his favorite chair. He especially likes mystery stories and the tales of horror and the supernatural. As a result, he has developed a very vivid imagination. Imagination. I'm telling you this because I think it's important for you to know something of Chester's background before I relate to you the story of the event following the arrival of Bonicula into our home. Let me begin with that first night. It seems that after I went to sleep, Chester, still stewing over the lost milk, settled down with his latest book and attempted to ignore the rumbling in his stomach. The room was dark and quiet. This did not prevent his reading. Of course, since as you know, cats can see in the dark. A shaft of moonlight fell across the rabbit's cage and spilled onto the floor below. The wind and the rain had stopped and as Chester re read Edgar Allan, Poe's, Edgar Allan Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher, he became increasingly aware of the eerie stillness that had taken their place. As Chester tells it, he suddenly felt compelled to look at the rabbit. I don't know what came over me, he said to me the next morning, but a cold chill ran down my spine. The little bunny had begun to move for the first time since he had been put in his cage. He lifted his tiny nose and inhaled deeply, as if gathering sustenance from the moonlight. He slipped his ears back close to his body, and for the first time, Chester said. I noticed the peculiar marking on his forehead. What had seemed an ordinary black spot between his ears took on a strange V-shape which connected with the big black patch that covered his back and each side of his neck. It looked as if he was wearing a coat. A uh, no, more like a cape than a coat. Through the silence had drifted the strains of a remote and exotic music. I could have sworn it, I could have sworn it was a gypsy violin, Chester told me. I thought perhaps a caravan was passing by, so I ran to the window. I remembered my mother telling me something about caravans when I was a puppy. But for the life of me, I couldn't remember what. What a caravan? I asked, feeling a little stupid. A caravan is a band of gypsies traveling through the forest in their wagons. Chester answered. Oh, yes. It was coming back to me now. It was coming back to me now. Station wagons? No, covered wagons. The gypsies travel all through the land, setting up camps around the great bonfires, doing magical tricks, and sometimes, if you cross their palms with a piece of silver, they will tell your fortune. You mean if I gave them a fork, they'd tell my fortune? I asked breathlessly. Chester looked at me with a disdain. Save your silverware, he said. It wasn't a caravan after all. I was disappointed. What was it? I asked. Chester explained that when he looked out the window, he saw Professor Michael White, our next door neighbor, playing the violin in his living room. 
He listened for a few moments to the haunting melody and sighed with a relief. I really got to stop I really got to stop reading these horror stories late at night, he thought. It's beginning to affect my mind. He yawned and turned to go back to his chair and get some sleep. As he turned, however, he was startled by what he saw. There in the moonlight, as the music filtered through the air, sat the bunny, his eyes intense and staring an earthly aura about them. Now this is the part you won't believe, Chester said to me. But, I, but as I watched, his lips parted in a hideous smile, and where a rabbit's buck tears should have been, two little pointed fangs glistened. I wasn't sure what to make of Chester's story, but the way he told it, it sent my hair on end.